Greetings, everyone, and welcome to today's leadership webinar. Thank you for joining. My name is Susan Patrick. I'm the president and CEO for iNACL and co-founder for Competency Works, and I'll be helping to facilitate today's webinar. Uh, as you can see in the lower left-hand corner of your screen, you'll see a chat box. Please introduce yourself. Let us know who you are, where you're tuning in from, and please ask us any questions here throughout the webinar, and we'll take time at the end for Q&A. Uh, our team will be tracking the questions uh, to help the presenters uh, be able to facilitate that questions and answers at the end. Uh, we'd love for you to share what you're learning during the webinar on social media, and we'll drop the media um, social media hashtag for the webinar and present our handles in the chat box. Today's webinar will be recorded and archived for future use. We'll send you a follow-up email with a link to the slides and the recording after the webinar. So let's begin. We are very grateful to have Lori Shepard and Scott Marion here with us today to present on assessment literacy. Please let me begin by formal introductions of our esteemed expert presenters today. Scott Marion is the President and Executive Director for the National Center for the Improvement in Educational Assessment, the nonprofit consulting firm. Dr. Marion's current project includes designing and supporting states in implementing assessment and accountability reforms, developing and implementing educator evaluation systems, and designing and implementing high-quality, locally designed, performance-based assessments. He is a recognized national leader in designing innovative and comprehensive assessment systems to support both instructional and accountability uses, including helping states and districts design systems of assessments for evaluating student learning of identified competencies. Also with us today is Lori Shepard, Distinguished Professor and Dean Emerita of the School of Education at the University of Colorado Boulder. Her research focuses on psychometrics and the use and misuse of tests in educational settings. Her technical work has contributed to validity theory, standard setting, and statistical models for detecting test bias. Her research studies on test use have addressed the identification of learning disabilities, readiness screening for kindergarten, grade retention, teacher testing, effects of high-stakes accountability testing, and most recently, the use of classroom assessment to support teaching and learning. I want to thank both of you for joining us today, and let me turn the microphone over to Scott to get started on this important topic. Scott? Thanks, Susan, and I'm really pleased to be here. Uh, one of the things that Susan uh, left out of uh, Lori's bio or my bio is that uh, I was a student of Lori's uh, many years ago and I'm still thrilled to be able to work with her on, on several things, and so we're uh, I'm pleased to get this started. i got to advance the slide. Let's see. So assessment literacy is uh, the topic that... Uh, we've been tasked to address today. And this came out of a meeting that Susan and I were at back in December where we heard a, a lot of uh, misunderstandings about assessment literacy. So we're using uh, this uh, definition uh, today as a starter, but we can go into more details, uh, and we will go into more details through the slides, and we think that extensions of this uh, definition and the nuances will merge as we talk. Um, so we're going to start off by by looking backwards first, and then I'm going to turn it over to Lori, and we're going to talk about what are some present and future ideas, and then we'll we'll go back and forth on a few other things. But we think that uh, many of the barriers to assessment literacy that we're seeing now are due to outdated methods and practices. And um, we're going to highlight just a few of them here uh, to, to get us started. So this is a, a, the diagram on the left. is from a, a Maury's uh, presidential address to the American Educational Research Association that was later published in Educational Researcher in 2000. It focuses on the importance of 
of understanding learning theory as the basis for educational measurement. Bob Mislevy once said that uh, modern psychometrics is essentially 21st century statistics applied to 19th century psychology. And what, what Lori uh, demonstrated and, and others uh, that was uh, we'll talk about knowing what students know have written about is that the, the theory of learning or the way that people conceive of how uh, students and other and adults come to know things and know subject matter is intricately linked to the way in which we end up measuring that. And it also, because curriculum is a critical part of how students learn and how we test, when you base the entire system on, on these, uh, either these trait theories of, uh, of psychology like IQ or the older behaviorist kinds of approaches that Skinner and others made popular, it leads you to a certain type of curriculum, what uh, Lori's named the social efficiency curriculum, moving everybody along at a, at a regular pace and uh, breaking things down into small bits of information. And you end up with test questions like the kind you see here. This is a, obviously a very simple question that uh, many of us who studied science have experienced many times about in our life. And you see that this doesn't require a lot of depth of thinking. It breaks things, not that it's an unimportant thing to know, but it does break things down into these small bits of information. This, uh, this view of, uh, of uh, taking us back to, to how uh, these outdated notions of how people learn and how we should assess also leads to this set of sort of very uncoordinated and incoherent assessments. Now, everybody is talking about assessment systems these days, and, and I wish I could say that I was making this up, but this assessment map is from a real school district, and I could have picked um, from any number of school districts to have that would have a similar type of map. And if you look at November, you say, well, thank goodness, that at least they could have some teaching, uh, because that looks like it's about the only time left for teaching. And so when we see this, these assessments disconnected from meaningful curriculum, where they're standalone or, uh, again, as Miss Lovey talks about, is dropped from the sky, they, um, you end up getting this, this just sort of mess of assessments where they don't necessarily connect with one another. Each theoretically is designed to serve a particular purpose, but not necessarily a purpose together. And it is just sort of tied to this idea of marching through a, uh, a, an outdated view of curriculum. The other problem that we're facing when it comes to building assessment literacy is we uh, have not just weak formative assessment traditions in U.S. classrooms, we have weak uh, assessment uh, for learning in general and classroom assessment uh, more specifically in, in in U.S. classrooms. First of all, our teachers get very little training in assessment, certainly in pre-service, um, but even in in-service. The, the, the problem that people will often, especially people uh, in, in our field in measurement, will often say, well, they need to take a course in assessment or in measurement before they graduate from their pre-service uh, program. And sometimes they do, and those courses end up uh, being very much about teaching about reliability, validity, and, and standard test formats, um, how do you construct a multiple choice, choice question, things like that. And that might help a little bit with, uh, with building some sense of assessment literacy, but it's decontextualized from use and from curriculum and how students are able to use these, uh, how our teachers are able to use the results of assessments to actually do something about instruction. We also see that uh, in one of the things that's holding us back, certainly, and many of us have seen this, that the, the classroom tests that we see are, are built to look a lot of ways like, like these standardized summative assessments that are given at the end of the year. And if, if that's all teachers are experienced, because either the, the, uh, the plethora of, of standardized summative assessments at the end of the year, or these interim assessments that are used, or some people call them benchmark assessments, that are made to look like these summative assessments. If that's all the teachers see, and that's what they see as, as valued in their school district, then 
they almost have uh, no choice but to try to make tests that look like that. And that leads to just uh, uh, sort of fairly useless assessments for improving instruction. The other thing we, we do see, there are a lot of formal assessments um, in classrooms, and whether they're the type that imitate these standardized tests or not, they're used to either to award grades or justify grades. And so too often we see that um, we, we see that uh, um, teachers just give an assessment, they grade it, and then they uh, they put it in the grade book, and that's all that's done with it. It's rare that, it's, uh, that we, we move on to actually doing something with the results to change uh, the, the kinds of misconceptions that have surfaced with the kids or other um, shortcomings in their understanding of the subject matter. Um, and then the informal assessments that we we like to see as part of formative assessments, these in the moment sort of things, are are, are underdeveloped and they're very um, uh, non randomly distributed across schools and teachers and, and districts. There's some teachers who who get it, either have trained and been trained in it, have, have some good uh, instincts around it, and others that that just don't. So I'm going to shift over to Lori now. Lori's going to take it and, and talk about how we're um, moving into the future and how we could move into the future in more positive ways. Thanks, Scott. Um, this is Lori, and I'm uh, grateful for the opportunity. Uh, thanks uh, to Susan and to Scott for the invitation. Um, this, and I'm also grateful to Scott for taking responsibility for talking about all the bad stuff. Uh, but we did uh, jointly think that characterizing where we are and uh, some of the negative places we've come from um, is a good way to then shift to uh, what would um, healthy and productive assessment literacy look like. And you can take this slide as the overview of the core of our presentation. Um, and notice, no standard deviations, no correlation coefficients. We want to emphasize these elements that contribute to assessment literacy having to do with research on how children learn, the idea that assessments have to be designed for their specific purposes, and we're going to explain more about that, and then um, looking at the authenticity or the richness of the content and skills that fully represent learning goals as being a critical element that everyone up and down the system from policymakers to classroom teachers need to understand uh, to be literate in assessment. And here's where we've um, started to think about purposes and users. And uh, notice that we put them in inverse order, uh, just to ask you to think a little bit about for what testing purposes do state policy leaders and perhaps district leaders need information and data uh, in contrast to what teachers, students, parents might need to know about uh, close up student learning. So we've listed uh, four purposes there that are um, most pertinent to this webinar. Um, and then we've listed several users. And in general, I would say that we would argue that each user has to know more about their particular use but we also have geared this webinar to the idea that everybody needs to know a little bit about each other's uses. Um, otherwise, um, they make mistakes. State policy leaders, for example, make mistakes when they think that their accountability test is a good test to inform day-to-day -day classroom instruction. And that would be a mistake on their part and something that I think we continue to struggle with. This um, 
it, blue picture is of uh, the uh, test standards of the American Educational Research Association, American Psychological Association, and National Council on Measurement and Education. We've included several references today, but this is not one that you would uh, need to read. Uh, maybe, uh, I think probably the assessment coordinator in every district knows this. It's the psychometrician's bible. But we include this one slide um, so that it's a matter of technical authority that tests have to be designed for their specific purposes and validated for those purposes. And notice midway down that sometimes the way you develop a test for one purpose and make it valid for that purpose could actually work against other purposes. And it's not true that policymakers th should think that one test could be made useful for all of the purposes up and down that system. So uh, this, this is a good touchstone to move on then to think more substantively about what do we, th what do we mean when we say assessments have to be tailored to their specific purposes. Here, this is a reference that we recommend. Knowing what students know is a report of the National Research Council, which is sort of the research arm of the National Academy of Sciences. It was put together by an, an, an authoritative panel of both measurement experts and teaching, learning, and content experts. And one thing they note about this purpose business is that there is, has to be a trade-off in assessment design. A trade-off in particular in distinguishing between accountability and instructional support. Those can't be the same thing. And a quotation from that volume, ironically, the questions that are of the most use to the state officer are of the least use to the teacher. Why? Because any summary test that would inform policy leaders, teachers already know the answers to. They know how to rank their students from best to worst or um, high achiever, low achiever, but that's not what they need to move learning forward. They need more detailed information. And this slide amplifies that distinction, helping to understand why accountability tasks, for example, or even program evaluation level uses at the district level have to be different from the classroom use. And these are features of what you need for accountability and not for the classroom. So for comparability, you have to have standardization to have fair accountability tests. But assessment in the classroom can be quite dynamic, not assessing all of the kids at the same time. Um, the first two bullets both speak to that. Um, it's even the case that very good instructional or formative assessment can be scaffolded, can be assisted. All of the research on good tutoring practices show how uh, sometimes giving hints and seeing what helps move students forward is good formative assessment, but dishonest for accountability testing. So we make this distinction between independent versus assisted performance. Feedback can be delayed for accountability and program level uh, information, but not for instructional purposes. And the, the technical requirements are quite different between accountability and classroom tests. You don't need such rigor for classroom purposes, because if you've made a mistake, you can change what you're doing the very next day. Not true uh, for accountability tests that have to be program fair and highly valid and reliable. So how do you keep these different assessments from being incoherent? That's what we're speaking to next. What knowing what students know called for was balanced assessment systems that, uh, and they chose balance because they wanted less high stakes testing, not to just overwhelm the system, and better um, equilibrium between the accountability external uses and the classroom units, uh, uses. And they said especially that such systems should have these features of coherence, which we're going to talk about, comprehensiveness, 
and those assessments should be continuous, meaning monitoring student progress over time. And their idea about comprehensiveness has to do with what you've heard about the need for multiple measures and also comprehensive with respect to all of your ambitious learning goals, not just what's easiest to measure. And here I'm uh, in the bottom of this slide citing um, Scott and um, his colleague uh, Raj Chatterun um, about assessment systems should be designed with these multiple purposes in mind and with an understanding of who needs what information. Who's responsible for balanced assessment systems? Well, everyone, but knowing that there are some state leaders and some district leaders on board for this uh, webinar, um, we emphasize district leaders here because very often that's where the locus of curricular control is. And we're going to talk about coherence, and you need to know what your curricular goals are as the basis for building coherence between what goes on in the classroom and what goes on at higher levels of aggregation. Knowing what students know emphasizes the idea that coherent assessment systems should be built on a shared model of learning. So we've been emphasizing how they're different, and the one thing that should be shared is they have to have the same vision of accomplished student proficiency and mastery. What does it look like? And also, what are the steps for getting there? And that has to be much more deeply instantiated, much more fine-grained to support learning in the classroom. This is another reference we recommend. It's another National Academy of Sciences, National Research Council report, How People Learn, talks about all of the cognitive and motivational research that in broad strokes informs us about student learning, that's big ideas like why rewards and punishments leads to extrinsic motivation that doesn't help students internalize and value their own learning. Um, so we have to worry about rewards and punishments. And similarly, we have to have cognitive models of what it means to develop deep expertise in a discipline or in an interest field of study. What do those competencies look like? So I'm going to turn that over, that idea of a shared model of learning to Scott um, to talk about competency-based examples. Thanks so much, Lori. So um, this is Ina Cole, and this is her leadership webinar. And so uh, we are interested in talking about how do we apply what we've been learning through the years about assessment literacy uh, to this developing field of competency-based education. Many of you know that I work very closely with the New Hampshire pilot, the competency-based pilot called Performance Assessment of Competency Education, and we're learning a lot about uh, assessment issues that are that are the same, many of them the same of some of the things that Lori has been talking about, and and there's some uh, some interesting uh, departures, but not very far departures. And so I, I love this quote, quote from a uh, recently uh, departed Philip Schleckley, and, and in a sense, this sort of uh, to me really really highlights what we mean about competency education. Right? Our job is to bring students into profound interactions with content and processes they will need to master to be judged well-educated or competent. So we could, uh, sometimes I think competencies can, can be a Rorschach test, but we have, uh, especially through Ina Cole and Competency Works leadership, have, have honed in on some uh, some common definitions that, that we're using in the field. And one of the things that uh, we're going to talk about a little bit uh, here in the next few slides is that something that, that I started seeing uh, when we, we got involved in competency education is that competencies were not always these deep instantiations of, of content and, and interdisciplinary skills. 
And so one of the things that we argue is that for competencies, uh, for, for, for us to realize the transformative power of competency-based education, competencies must authentically represent deep and meaningful learning goals. Not saying there's not a place for uh, ensuring that kids have skills and things like that, but the competencies themselves must be uh, deep and meaningful learning goals. And that, um, so when we think then if, if these are deep and meaningful learning goals, we, we want assessments that in a sense embody, that, that clearly represent at a, at a deep level these learning goals. It's almost if you think about it as a, if you think about it like a, a legislative intent, and, uh, likening it to a different field. It's, it's not just that we've checked all the boxes in an alignment sense, which actually can distract you from uh, having your assessments really embody the, the real meaning of the competency. Um, and, and so that's, that really sort of changes the game in a lot of ways for folks as, as, as you move from this simple checklist approach to really uh, ensuring and asking yourself, and, and we've designed several approaches for doing this, the sort of modifications of of what we call evidence-centered design to really get at this notion of embodiment. And, and why do we why do we care about this that much? Right? We we talk about, we throw around terms like 21st century skills or application or things like that. But again, Laurie was referring to um, these these learnings that we've come, that's come out of the research about how people learn. And one of the things that we're, we're, we're quite clear about is that in order to facilitate transfer or application to new and novel situations, we need to have a deep understanding of the thing for which we want to transfer. So we need deep, deep understanding of the discipline or the skills in order to facilitate transfer. If you think about experts, there's been a lot of work on, on novice experts. If you think about Eric Erickson's work in terms of experts who recognize have the, uh, have the deep understanding to recognize the features of a new situation for what they have to, uh, what knowledge they're able to draw, what new things they might need to apply. And students can't develop this deep understanding unless they're provided multiple and varied opportunities with both the learning and the assessment task. That doesn't mean that the same task is used for learning and assessment. Um, you, you, but they should be closely connected and, and uh, are good representations of one another. So in, in the competency-based world, there are uh, certain assessment opportunities that are sometimes challenges, depending on how you look at them. So one of the, uh, as we list here, um, four key features of assessment of competency uh, in a competency-based education com uh, context. So one of the things you hear most often, right, is we want, to, we want students to be able to uh, demonstrate their learning at their own point of readiness. We want assessments that contribute to student learning by encouraging students to apply and extend their knowledge. We want students to demonstrate their learning. It's why performance assessments are called for so often in competency-based settings. And where possible, we want to have uh, some flexibility in how students demonstrate their learning. For instance, some might do it through a video presentation. Others might do it through a research paper or something like that. Now, these are all good things to do. But when we put on our measurement hats, the first bullet, uh, having students uh, demonstrate this at varying points in time, and the last bullet, flexibility in how students demonstrate their learning, um, gives gives measurement folks some uh, some heartache at time. But you know, Lori and I, the kind of measurement folks, are willing to take on these problems and push forward. I, I know that my colleague Susan Collins, uh, Susan Lyons, is uh, is, is on the uh, on the webinar as well, and she and I have been sort of wrestling. Uh, some of these things to the ground in, in, in our project in New Hampshire, particularly on this flexibility piece. The, the other part, I don't want to just leave it at the competency determination. Much of the focus of competency-based assessment tends to be on that summative assessment. And even though there's 
we talk about assessment for learning, uh, talking Rick Stiggins, you know, one who coined that term and lots of others have adopted it. We, we talk about that, but much of the focus on competency, whether people talk about moving on when ready or moving on when you demonstrate things, has a summative implication. And that's not bad. It's just a fact. You want to ensure that the student has learned something before you perhaps allow them to move on to something else. But formative assessments have to be a key part of a competency-based education system. And just as Laura was talking earlier about different users have to be expert in different aspects of these full assessment systems but need to know about all parts. So teachers need to be experts in formative assessment practices. In a competency-based world, they also have to be expert at being able to judge when students have mastered the content well enough to be declared competent. And the thing about, um, in, in a competency-based world, formative assessments, uh, and formative assessment processes, as it should be better termed, allows us to actually uh, have students be provided with feedback, and sometimes it could be self-assessment or teacher-led assessment um, processes that enable the students to see how to improve their performance over time to ultimately achieve those competencies along the, this sort of learning progression that Lori talked about earlier. It should be able to, these formative assessments should help us um, develop classroom expectations that call for application and generalization to build towards true mastery. We'll talk a little bit more about generalization shortly. And then, and really importantly, they, they should lead to an internalization of criteria for success and to help build student agency. We've, we've come across a few issues um, in assessment of, of competency-based systems. Now, Lori mentioned scaffolding earlier as a really important instructional activity. And, and I obviously agree with that. One of the things we've seen when, when students are engaged in extended projects as part of the competency uh, demonstration is that so the teacher um, basically lead the student along for three or four weeks while they work on this project? Or would you say that a good teacher has some responsibility to interact with the student during that time? Well, how much of it is, is scaffolding? How much of it is just uh, sort of general support? In many cases, particularly uh, I do a lot of work in science, a lot of the work we see is group work for part of the projects, and that's entirely appropriate educationally. Scientists do work in group. It's efficient and it makes sense educationally. Many times people want to say, well, whose work is this? Who's, who am I judging to be competent? And so that's one thing we have to figure out how to uh, deal with. Generalizability I want to talk about is one of the most important issues here, right? It's how much evidence do you, do you need to be clear that a student is, is in fact competent? And there's two uh, Two main thrusts of that. So f imagine if I uh, give a student an assessment in October, let's say, to judge whether or not they're, they're competent or they've mastered a certain subject matter that they learned at that point. Do I care whether or not they are still able to uh, draw on that knowledge in May or June at the end of the school year? Are they able to apply that knowledge? Or am I satisfied that they demonstrated it once and that's enough? And so being able to use that again in a, perhaps a different context or a deeper level later on is one aspect of generalization. But the other part that I see, um, uh, I see Ray, uh, that I see uh, most concerned about often in competency systems is we'll give a student a task and if they do well on that task, we'll call them competent. If I would have given them a similar task but different, they might not have done as well. And so what decision would I make then? And so this issue of being able to support the inferences that I want to support about the student being competent are very, uh, are, are very tricky and, and have to be thought through very carefully as we build our assessment systems. And the last bullet here on comparability is um, Again, we don't expect students to do the same thing. It would be really boring if everybody did the same exact project, and it would be just the wrong way to go about educating kids in a lot of ways. 
But if we want to make an inference when I say that uh, that Lori is confident in argumentative writing, and anybody who knows her knows she is, but, but if I wanted to say that, that Lori is confident in argumentative writing, and I wanted to say that Susan is confident in argumentative writing at the same grade level, do I care that those inferences are comparable? And if they are, then it involves uh, me taking certain steps. So now I'm going to uh, turn this back to Lori to talk about some ways and strategies that we think about for building assessment literacy. Now we've talked about assessment literacy. Uh, what do we do about it now? Right. Thanks, Scott. So in this last segment, uh, and we're watching the time, and we want to uh, save plenty of time, um, so we have just a few remaining slides, but we thought it was unfair to say, well, this is what assessment literacy looks like, this is what it must address and think about, and then not say some things about how um, districts uh, and states and schools can make uh, productive progress toward this kind of assessment literacy. Here in this slide, we acknowledge it's been a problem forever. Um, and now, especially, it's a difficult undertaking because teachers are being asked to do lots of new things all at the same time because they're being asked to teach in fundamentally different ways. And they have new demands from external accountability tests. And now someone is layering on this idea, and you have to have the, uh, an assessment expert <coughs> excuse me, at the same time. So here we just uh, acknowledge Rick Stiggins as someone who's provided a lot of this professional training, especially in the area of classroom assessment. We think that um, we can all be informed by the kind of research that's been done on teaching that shares the same models of um, child and adult learning that we cited in how people learn. But now when the teachers are the learners, we still have to have some idea about how that learning can be contextualized in practice, else it's just layered on and meaningless. So here we cite uh, Putnam and Borko's um, sort of milestone uh, review of all of the research on uh, teaching and teacher learning. And these are the things that teachers need to change practices in deep ways. They need time to do it, and that's not just planning. They need time to locate it in their practice. They need conceptual and strategic support and opportunities to try practices in the context of their own teaching, not ones that over time recursively with this idea of coming back to um, leaders and experts who can help with. So this is what you said we wanted to do with competency-based education. But I tried this and it didn't work. Now what should I do? It's that kind of recursive support over time that helps people change in really deep ways. And uh, to elaborate on that, uh, teachers are swamped with a multitude of assessment-related demands, therefore. These efforts to enhance assessment literacy have to be woven in, taken up at the same time that you're trying to make curricular changes, not spend two years on uh, getting into project-based education and then two years from now think about the assessment aspects. I saw one of the chat uh, room comments was, I've been to PBE. Um, and I haven't ever heard anyone talk about formative assessment. Yeah, I think that that's a little bit of an issue because so much is going into making the capstone and culminating summative assessments analogous to grading, different from the past practice. That's where the focus has been. But it actually helps if you think, and how do we think by examples from actual student work kids get from novice to proficient at the end. And that's what teachers need support in doing, and that's what students need too, someone enabling that model of working forward. So we've listed here a bunch of things. You don't um, supply all of these things for every instructional task, but you do have some models so people can learn from it, adults can learn from it, and generalize to the specifics of their subject matter and their classrooms. 
So this is a, an issue of extended support that's required. And now Scott is going to uh, take us uh, just a little bit further, and then we'll wrap up for questions. Yeah, thanks, Lori. And so, again, this is great. I'm following the chat, chat and trying not to be distracted. It's a really great question, so we want to get to them. And I just want to emphasize, and this really builds on what Lori was talking about on the research on teaching from, from Ralph Putnam and Hilda Borko um, and, and many others. And this, this follows right from, but we're in, we are trying to employ these competency-based systems and uh, because we're trying to engage students in more authentic and meaningful learning. So why would we do anything different for the teachers? We're going we're gonna to put somebody in a sit and get professional development session on how they need to engage students in meaningful learning. I couldn't think of anything more torturous and, and unfair. And so if you haven't read uh, Dick Elmore's Instructional Core, you, you will thank me for this homework assignment. Go download it and read it this weekend. But it's a, it's a fabulous uh, short little paper. But here's one of his principles, right? We learn to do the work by doing the work, not by telling other people to do the work, not by having done the work at some point, you know, some time in the past, and not by hiring someone to do the work. So this is the, so as we build many of these uh, professional learning systems in, in various states uh, around the country to support competency-based education, we've taken this really to heart, this notion that you have to deeply engage uh, teachers in the same way that you would want to engage students. And it really does come down to authentic learning. One of the things I had an experience years ago in, when I uh, was leading this effort in Wyoming, we had this very nice, uh, we called it a standards-based institute, and, and all the right things that you would want, uh, multiple days of professional development embedded in practice, um, and teachers developed and tried out assessments, and, but nothing counted for anything. If they wanted to use it, they could. At the same time, we had this body of evidence uh, graduation system going on as a little task one of Lori's favorite tasks there, the this, uh, natural selection and, and classification task called Convoliticus. We had this body of evidence uh, process going on. It really hit me at the time that the teachers involved in that learned so much more and were able to apply their learning in such deeper ways than the teachers who'd been through this nine-day uh, professional development experience where they were actually doing all the things that you would say are the right things. But this counted. The tasks that they were developing counted towards students. It wasn't a high-stakes graduation exam, but counted towards determination of student competency for graduation over the course of four years. We see the same thing in the New Hampshire PACE project. The common assessments that are being developed by these phenomenal teams of teachers are being used to support both competency determinations for kids but also to be used as part of this bridging uh, local and state accountability system. So these assessments are being authentically used, and no surprise, we see much greater learning and deepening of expertise on the part of teachers. And the last thing I want to wrap up on is this notion I just said of building expertise. Simply building assessment literacy or building capacity is not enough and if you want to scale any of these efforts, you need to ensure that at least some of your educators and others have really deep expertise. A lot of people talk about, well, we're going to use the train-the-trainer model. Don't use it. It doesn't work. There's no evidence of its effectiveness. And so we, following the research basis, we've been uh, relying on this uh, approach, uh, this framework that came out of uh, Laban Wanger back in 1991 about how apprentices become masters. And I won't go into great detail about this now, but again, the importance is that it's actually based in a research tradition, and we've been able to apply that research tradition effectively to build expertise. Susan, um, I see a lot of questions. I see you have some great ones about international cases and, and why we don't have good curriculum, but I'll let you uh, take over the moderation from here. Thank you, Scott. And just thanks again to Scott Laurie. Wow, what uh, amazing information you provided over this webinar. I'm really looking forward to the 
questions, answers, comments, suggestions, feel free to type them in the chat box. So I'm going to key it up because I think this is a, a, a really fundamental question um, that just came in from Marsha McCaffrey. Uh, and she asks, can you speak to the relationship between competency-based education and standards? Probably the most common question I am asked when I work with New Hampshire teachers. Uh, so, Lori, I don't know if you want to take that or I'll, I'll start. I, I, I know Marsha. She's a, uh, she's a plant in the audience, but uh, she's a good one. Uh, um, Scott, you can go ahead, uh, unless Marsha is asking us again because she didn't like your answer. <laughs> she could be. Go ahead. So, what, what I see with standards, and Lori will. Well, uh, uh, chime in here as well. What I see with standards, they're often lists of content um, without necessarily a particular. They do have an organizing frame. I don't want to say that, but they're often lists of content and uh, skills are separately. What I see with competencies is competencies are are supposed to be about bigger ideas uh, than than a single standard, and they often have. Uh, if done right, have a performance expectation built right into the competency, and that's why it requires that demonstration. And so it's it's, it's almost a combination of a content and performance standard ar around a big idea. I don't know, Laura, if you want to add to that at all. Um, well, I'll just uh, emphasize um, the point about integration and say that we've seen both sort of superficial, not great competency um, examples, but also some very deep and wonderful, and potentially um, the new generation standards, both Common Core and um, Next Generation Science standards, have an important shared component, and that is to bring practices, which include things like modeling and mathematics and argumentation across subject areas. Uh, which are skills in competency-based education. The integration of those practices within content domains is critically important because of what we've said about research on learning. One thing that contemporary models of learning recognize is that becoming expert is part is participation in a community. It might be gaming, it might be all around all the practices of church choir, but it's learning to be part of that community and the practices of that community as well as the content of that discipline or practice. And so competency-based education has the um, wherewithal to become the way that this gets instantiated. But it's important that that underlying principle be understood and uh, manifest in how you how you do the work. Hey, Susan. Thank you, Susan, I see this great question here that uh, um, that Lori would love, and I take one credit. How do we uh, help teachers use uh, former assessments without feeling like they're always teaching two or four tests? Is it okay if we take that one off? Yeah, I was going right there. Lori, do you see that? Do you want me to repeat the rest of the question? No, well, I'm reading it. Um, why are, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, I, I want to say, but I, I'm not sure I'm being fair to the question, that uh, the conception of formative assessment that we are advocating um, rarely re resorts to scoring student efforts and student work. It's very qualitative in nature. Yes, it does uh, in an ordinal way talk about progress toward the ultimate competencies, but it gives students feedback qualitatively about where they're doing their very best and where they need to improve and how to improve is why we see the formative assessment literature being completely congruent with what competency-based systems are trying to do. Yeah, let me just add one thing, because I see the second part of this, it says performance-based assessments and a culture of seeking growth and learning, uh, not just reaching a benchmark, seem to go a long way towards meeting this need. And 
I agree with, with that, especially this culture of growth. And I think what, what just to emphasize what Lori is saying, if you're thinking about formative assessment as a thing, especially a thing that you have to buy, it's probably not, I bet, it's not the way that Lori and I are thinking about it. Formative assessment would almost be better termed as formative instruction. It's those things that the teachers do in the moment. And one of the things that I, I hear, and I don't think you're suggesting this, I think it's, her name was Amanda, but what I've seen people in competency situations do is they'll let the kid try the task, and if the kid doesn't do well on the task, they might do a little remediation and give the kid almost the same task again or, or something like it, very close to it. And they call it formative when they're giving it to them when they're not going to count it for a competency. And that's not really what we mean. That's, that's really just practicing or uh, truly teaching to the test. And that's not the kinds of things we're advocating at all. Thanks, Scott. Thanks. Here's another really great question from Christine Colella. How fair is it to the student to be assessed based on competencies while the teachers are becoming literate in competency-based education? Well, the example here is in Vermont, the class of 2020, the present freshman students, will have a competency-based transcript and have been graded on competency-based education, but teachers have just started their literacy on these assessments. So how do we educate and inform parents is the follow-up here. This is a really interesting question. I mean, we've gone from that sort of pre-no child left behind in the 90s where you had several states, including Vermont, New York, many, many of the states that you worked with. Scott, who started to do some very interesting work in performance assessments uh, and assessment literacy, and that all kind of got frozen out in 2001 with a focus on making sure all 50 states, which only 11 had state standards, but went to standards uh, under No Child Left Behind, and, and here in December 2015 passed a new federal law on the Every Student Succeeds Act, and this is really a window of opportunity. Uh, most states aren't, aren't fully embracing this opportunity, but hopefully they'll get there. Uh, you've worked with New Hampshire on what was once their ESSA waiver, but the PACE program, here's an innovative assessment mo uh, model focusing in on performance assessments, competency-based education, really groundbreaking, and by the way, modeling what we see in global best practices. For those those um, folks in that great question by Chris, Christine, like how do we think about this during the, the transition and, and the opportunity uh, that we have? Uh, Laura, do you want me to start with this one? Yes, go uh, So, you know, here in New Hampshire, we like to say bad things about people in Vermont, but in this case, I know the Vermont leaders very well, and I know that they're uh, their hearts in the right place. So it's really hard to answer this without knowing the full context of what's exactly expected of kids' demonstrations. Um, and so the so the, the easy answer I would give is we all, we often see accountability rushing ahead of practice, and that usually leads to some some bad behaviors uh, because that's people respond in the only way they know how to respond. Um, so I don't I, without knowing the specific policy, what they mean by uh, students demonstrating competencies to graduate, it's hard for me to really uh, fairly answer this. I will say, you know, looking back at the Wyoming Body of Evidence system that was uh, started, really started full-blown in 2003, it ran for a few years until uh, the, the, the people that gave up on it, um, it was a system essentially of having students evaluated on demonstrations of learning over a four-year period. So. Again, I'm not trying to weasel out of the question. We, we, we agree teachers need to be supported. Students need to be given fair opportunities to learn. Um, and sometimes accountability demands run ahead of that practice. Uh, the only thing I, I will add is that um, remember um, earlier when Scott was talking about just how comparable do things have to be 
I think um, speaking as um, you know, really ancient uh, evaluator and assessment expert, um, I call this the apples and oranges problem. Um, that is, how do you make things that are different evaluate to be the same or enough the same? Um, and so I think that uh, system administrators and teachers need to be mindful of this issue of fairness and ask themselves um, if we were using the neighboring district's exit requirements, would this student look sufficient to graduate? Um, are those just too um, high or too low? Or are we asking students to demonstrate um, their competence in just one way? And had we asked a different way, would they look competent? Remember, in the real world, there are lots of ways to develop, to demonstrate proficiency. Um, and that's what, um, under knowing what students know, the idea of comprehensiveness, not make them do all of the things, make them do enough to demonstrate proficiency at least some of the ways so it doesn't become an artifact of your tools that denies a diploma, for example. Susan, I see we have a few minutes left. We're happy to take some more questions if you want to pose them. Sure, and there's a really good question from Jocelyn here, which really refers back to the slide 21, so I'll put it on the screen. What answers or approaches have, have you seen to the complexity shared in the slide 21, scaffolding, group work, how much evidence? So what are those, what are those solutions to some of these uh, assessment issues? I, I, I know that when I've... Um, spent some time with uh, international experts in this, like to look at comparability, they set up processes for comparability in terms of uh, moderation, calibration. Um, can you talk a little bit around these issues and some ways that they might be addressed? Yeah, so I don't want to um, toot our own horn too much, but I have uh, my colleagues Susan Lyons and Jerry Thompson, I know, are on this call. Marsha McCaffrey is involved. She asked a question earlier, is involved in this performance assessment project in New Hampshire. And what Lori just talked about, about the, uh, would a student who you declare competent or graduation ready in District A be competent or graduation ready in District B, given the same evidence? And that's something we worry about. So when we're working with the, the the teachers and, and the multiple districts involved in the PACE project, when we're talking about things that are uh, in common, so we have some common performance assessments across districts, the teachers have to come to agreement on what's an allowable amount of scaffolding in this task. What are the re rules and requirements for group versus individual work and how we can ensure that? Um, and, and so things like that. The, the generalizability, um, we, you know, they, they get advice from us on, on uh, what does it take to have sufficient evidence, and especially on the comparability. We help with those sort of audits. About, but those are kind of processes that lots of people could set up. Uh, trading papers, you know, uh, re redacting the student name, re redacting the student names, but trading papers across districts. Um, or see how people would score things or evaluate student work similarly, similarly or differently. But we found that, um, and believe me, this was not uh, something we, we, I wish we thought about all these things ahead of time, but as they come up, we say, oh, we better write a little uh, brief on scaffolding or we better write a, write a little brief on who owns the work and then work with the teachers to establish some rules and common procedures that we agree on. As long as we could come to agreement, it's okay. It's when we, when we don't know and these things are left, um, you know, to, to random fluctuations where we get into big trouble. Interesting. Lori, did you want to add on any of these issues? Um, I'll just, I'll just um, speak almost about an instructional practice that, that is relevant to this um, fairness issue. To me, scaffolding is an instructional support. 
and when I am a teacher, I'm helping, I'm providing support, um, sometimes narrowing the task um, so that the student can master that to move on to a more uh, challenging task or version of the, of the work that we want done. Um, I actually make it part of my instructional practice to make visible to students how we're going to be removing the supports. So we actually, while we're working, point to what independent expertise would look like so that uh, we're both pointing and moving toward that goal. Um, the generalizability requirement for the student is a learning challenge because I want them to not only do the one task I help them good at, get, get good at and the next task that I help them with, but now I want to point at tasks like that that aren't just a simple copy but related and I want to now usher them out the door to go do that on their own and I don't consider them masters or expert until they can do it on their own. So generalizability is a very stern requirement and scaffolding is an enabling requirement and you have to think about both in your system. Thank you. And I know we're at time now. Christine just commented, Lori, transparency is key, so thank you. And I would just like to um, wrap up in closing. Thank you so much for your time, for your expertise, for your willingness to share um, really important knowledge around assessment literacy with the field. Uh, I just want to also, um, Audrey, your last comment in here about a topic for its own webinar on effective practices and teacher preparation. I was thinking just that. I would love um, to ask about effective uh, practices you've seen in teacher preparation, both for assessment literacy, but also in uh, preparing educators to be ready to implement, design, and lead the change in competency-based education. So I will take that as a charge and marching order uh, to organize a, a webinar on that topic. So please join me in thanking our uh, experts, our, our guest presenters today. Thank you so much, uh, Scott and Lori, and we'll look forward to uh, staying, staying uh, 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 up to date with the latest work, and, and thank you for your research and, and taking on this topic. It was really terrific, and we appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Susan, and thank you, Lori. Thank you.